Hello kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. This is chapter 37.6, the last of the of the sub subchapters of the M Shadow of the Ministries, and this is the chapter of Rarity. And I'm pretty curious what Rarity is. The Rarity isn't exactly my most favorite pony. She is surely isn't the last. So, I really want to find about Rarity because I felt closest, one of the closest to her in some way. Because of her sense of fashion. I love fashion. I may not dress okay, but I, li I like to dress what makes me feel good. It's like suits. I like suits, for example. Uh, and she likes dresses. I like suits. We can have something in common. So, I'm rambling again. Sorry, guys. I'm a bit tired. I haven't really... Sl I haven't had a good sleep schedule. i kind of been napping throughout the day. <clears throat> you know, on my lunch breaks and shit. Uh. And, um, anyway, back to this main point. This is going to be a very short chapter. It's about 23 minutes. And I'm curious how the Shadow of the Ministries will end, since it ends with Rarity. And why specifically Rarity, of all characters? Why Rarity? Uh, did it go in a proceeding of order of way the writer favorited them, or... What? Um, or you, you, K Cat, I know you watch these when you can. Um, but seriously, uh, I'm very curious. What is the point being driven across? What is the point? Because the last one didn't really give me answers as much that I was, um, as much as the other ones did. It basically gave, gave an example of what's going on with the towers. And I don't know what's going up with them. So, um, anyway, let's get on with it, shall we? Velvet Remedy and I trotted back down the red now. Steel is floating along beside me, our weapons and supplies floating behind. I winced, holding a hoof to my chest. Velvet Remedy had done what she could for me with her magic, rebuilding the rib I had lost. But it hurt like hell, and I was still having trouble breathing. The damage had weakened me, and it would take time, and potions, before I would regain my endurance. I plan to ascend, Red Eye had told me. Some pony will have to take up the tasks that the princesses and Pegasi left to run wild, after all. Some pony will have to regulate the weather, to raise the sun and the moon. Weather control. Now, I knew how he intended to pull that off. Just as I knew how he was going to become a god, capable of doing Celestia's and Luna's tasks. And I realized he would be able to move the sun and the moon, too, since neither of them stood in the way, too. As Princess Luna had told Midnight Shower, Trump his efforts. I wasn't sure on the details, but by now I had learned enough to know that Red Eye had a plan, even if I couldn't see it. That cyber pony knew exactly what he was doing. After hacking the Ministry of Awesome's terminal, I have been able to review the specifics of the Single Pegasus project. Unfortunately, without my pit buck, I had no way of saving a copy or any of the information or schematics. It occurred to me that I may need to have the memory recorded so that I could review it later. What I didn't know, what I didn't learn until a lot later, was that accessing the terminal had set off alarms someplace far away, and that war was coming. Several things were clear. The Single Pegasus project was indeed designed for equestria-wide weather control. The center hub for the SPP located above the clouds, and had some of the most fearsome defenses I had ever imagined, including a shield that put the one in the Ministry of Awesome to shame. There was a bypass spell on the shield, but I had no idea who it was designed to allow through. My guess was Rainbow Dash. The suspended animation pod from which the entire single Pegasus project was supposed to be run was unoccupied. It had never even been activated. A dull rumble shook the Ministry of Awesome. The lights above swayed, the dust showered down, and poorly stacked boxes thudded to the floor throughout the building. I looked up, shocked from my reverie. I turned to Velvet Remedy as another tremor vibrated the floor. We trotted faster, my chest beginning to ache badly as we picked up the pace. Sorry. We flung the door open, and we were greeted by chokingly thick pink and flames. My lungs collapsed and I fell to the ground, my magic imploding and dropping steel hooves. 
I felt myself dying, the pink cloud tearing me apart like I was filled with Philadelphia of Paris brights. Velvet Remedy collapsed next to me with a weak cry. The basement of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences had exploded. The suffering Alicorn had finally lost her battle. Or perhaps the clinking chains had let off a spark. The whole Ministry was on fire, as were the dead trees. All of them, including the ones that formed the Ministry of Peace. I could hear the building groaning as it began to buckle. The basement had been huge, stretching under about a third of Ministry Walk, and when it blew, the explosion breached the tunnel between the Royal Treasury and Princess Celestia's School for Gifted Unicorns. The remains of the field were filling with an instantly lethal concentration of pink cloud. Setting off the gala fireworks and turning the mother dragon into a mouse had not made all that cloud magically disappear. It was more diffused here, but that just meant we had seconds more to live. Maybe a full minute, and most of that without consciousness. My vision blurred and darkened. I felt Pyrolite thump down limply on my back. I barely saw the shadow of the Sky Bandit dropping out of the air before us. Velvet Remedy shoved all three of the Super Restoration potions she was still carrying into my muzzle, making me drink, then fell into unconsciousness. I felt my body jolted alive as the overdose of healing magic flooded through me. I was alive to the point I was burning up. My nerves were on fire. But I was conscious, and that was enough to levitate every pony and everything about me. I tossed us all into the Sky Bandit, shouting for Calamity to fly as fast as he could. Already, I was beginning to weaken, the cloud clawing at me. The pink cloud was hurting Calamity too, and fast was not very fast at all. I could hear him grunt, straining to keep us aloft, whinnying with the effort. I pulled open Velvet Remedy's medical boxes. We were out of super restoration potions, but maybe she had a healing potion left. Nothing. I closed it and crawled around to her other side, but before I could open the box, Calamity fell unconscious. The Sky Bandit began to fall. I tried to focus, but my brain felt like it was being beaten with a sledgehammer. I screamed with the effort. My lungs were hot coals in my breast. Tapping into reserves I shouldn't have had anymore. Be strong, be unwavering, be awesome. I enveloped us with my magic, my horn flaring with an overglow. The strain was excruciating. The sky band had drifted downwards until it splashed into the river, heavily ribboned with pink, which formed a moat around the front of Canterlot. I was tossed forward, falling on top of Velvet Remedy. The Sky Bandit seemed willing to float, the magic that allowed Calamity to pull it through the air with us all inside apparently making it buoyant. Or maybe the goddesses were again showing us mercy. Either way, I released my magic, falling weakly to the floor of the passenger wagon. I pressed a hoof against Velvet Remedy's neck and checked Pyrolite's breathing. They were both unconscious, but alive. I prayed neither of them were in a coma. The passenger wagon began to turn lazily in the flowing water. My ears perked as they caught the sound of a roaring waterfall. Oh no, oh no. So much for the mercy of the goddesses. Oh no. I didn't even waste the time and energy to get back to my hooves. I just threw my magic around the sky bandit and prayed. The passenger wagon reached the edge and began to tip. My horn flared again, enveloped by another overglow as I struggled to keep us from somersaulting. The water continued to shove us over the outcropping. We burst through the pink cloud, and we were falling. I pushed us forward, as far away from the falling water as I could while we fell. I kept us from flipping and slowed our fall. But I didn't have the strength to stop our fall completely, or even really guide us. Canterlot was a long way up the side of the mountain. Velvet Remedy was thrown from the passenger wagon when the Sky Bandit hit the Zebra Town aqueduct with a jarring thud. It was almost wide enough for the passenger wagon to slide down broadside. Now, before we continue, I like to make a comment here. Think of all the shit that's just going on here, just at the beginning of the chapter. Like, there's so much shit happening. I. One of the things that I like about this story, it just throws you right into the next chapter, just like that. It like, throws you into the action. And that's what I like about the story, because it just gets you really riled up. You don't know what's going on entirely. Whew. Her body landed in the aqueduct and was swept away in the rushing water. Whoa, Nelly! Cal Calamity jerked to consciousness, flapping his wings as hard as he could. 
I dodged Steelhoe's sliding body and jumped out after Velvet as Calamity struggled to get the passenger wagon under his control. I heard a peeling metallic scream behind me as the Sky Bandit scraped against the walls of the aqueduct, Calamity trying to pull up. Ahead of me, I saw Velvet's body. I lashed out with my telekinesis. Water splashed into my muzzle. I wheezed, fire igniting in my lungs again, worse than before. My magic faltered on the edge of burnout. I focused harder, kicking with all four legs as I battled to keep my head above the water while concentrating on Velvet Remedy. I had to get us out of the water before she drowned. I cast out my magic again, and this time I caught her, lifting her up and out of the water even as we both rushed down the aqueduct. I began to draw her closer, reeling her in. Now, I was merely struggling to keep from being pulled under. It was a losing battle. I was not even an adequate swimmer. My head went under and my lungs took in water. I broke the surface again, coughing violently. My magic had imploded and Velvet had fallen back into the water two ponies lengths away from me. One of the collapsed sections of the aqueduct loomed just ahead. I kicked, this time propelling myself forward. I reached out, hooking my foreleg around Velvet's, trying to grab a hold of her, wishing I had talons rather than hooves. I got my other foreleg around her neck. We twisted about in the water, rushing toward the edge as I tried to keep either of us from drowning. I fought to wrap us in magic, but I was too overstressed and exhausted. The spell wouldn't manifest. We washed over the side, plummeting towards the broken blocks of the aqueduct below. Calamity caught us, and then promptly splashed landed at the edge of the lake which had formed beneath the broken aqueduct. Velvet Remedy and I flew out of his forelegs and hit mud, sliding to a stop. I struggled to get up, to crawl over to her and make sure she was still breathing. I would have settled for squirming through all the mud if only to get me closer, but my body wouldn't respond at all. It had quit. Too much trauma, too much stress, all in too short a period of time. That was enough. The wash from the landing Griffin Chaser 4 tugged at my hood and flapped my cloak behind me. I watched as Rarity stepped off of the flying machine, her head bundled in a fashionable scarf to protect her mane from the wind. She trod towards me as the pony-pedaled whirligig lifted back into the brilliant sky. I basked in the light and warmth of the midday sun, such a rare and precious gift, as my host watched the beautiful white unicorn approaching. Ah, there you are. She smiled, as if my host had been lost. Is everything ready? Yes, Mistress Rarity, my host said in a naturally husky voice. If I may ask, who will be the victim of this spell? Rarity cocked her head, looking at my host oddly. Why, me, of course. I felt my host's jaw drop. I wouldn't dream of doing something like this to any other pony. Um, of course, my host said, clearly taken aback. Then, if I may ask, how many? The Griffin Chaser 4 was now far enough away that the wind had died. The squeaking sound of the machine was fading into the distance. Rarity motioned with a hoof for my host to follow, walking towards a set of glass doors on a quaintly nondescript building. My host galloped forward and tipped his head. I felt the casual flow of magic as he opened the door for the Ministry Mayor. Why, thank you, she beamed at him. Such manners. Rarity gave my host a kiss on his horn. He turned, following her inside watching her reverently. She was gorgeous, sexy in a way that transcended her age, regal, and my host was male, yet the only stirring was in his heart. He was a perfect gentle stallion, and not just in appearance. I found that he was a male I didn't quite mind having as my host in the slightest, and I felt ashamed, remembering what I had done weeks ago while sick in Steelhoof's shack. My host was a better pony than I. 42. Are you really feeling that guilty about masturbating? I'll be honest. Come on, it's a natural thing. We, every, uh, almost everybody does it. Already announced. My host stopped dead, his heart skipping a beat, 
and not in a good way. His muzzle gaped, his eyes widening in shock, if not outright horror. F- F- Forty-two? My own mind was reeling with the number. Well, actually forty-three, she said whimsically. I do wish to keep a small part of myself. You? My host stood there, shaking. You want me to cut your soul into forty-two pieces, he said weakly. I mean, forty-three. Yes, she nodded primly. Rarity smiled, walking up to my host and putting a hoof on his shoulder. Don't worry, I know you can do this. I... I... No. My host blinked. I'm always telling ponies that my top magician is the absolute master when it comes to magic and cutting things, she said encouragingly. And that, Snips, is you. Snips? My host, Snips, swallowed nervously and... Snips as in Snips and Snails? Those two idiots? You're kidding me, right? Well, I gotta get his, his, um... His kitty mark is scissors, so it must be correct on something. Nodded. Now, is the chamber ready? You've had enough time with the black book. Snips nodded again. But, Mistress Rarity, 43? I can't be sure you'll survive, or what you'll be like afterwards. Rarity's smile faltered, revealing a deep sadness behind her mask. I'll survive. We all will. She pulled her warm, confident demeanor back on. Now I've sent snails to the soul jars. He'll be doing the guidance, so don't you worry about that. From what I've heard, the shards should seek out the vessels snails. themselves, so it's practically idiot-proof. She patted me on the shoulder. Just worry about the cutting. Shards are your soul? My host said softly. Pieces. A lot of pieces began to fall into place. Yes. Rarity took a deep breath. Now, I'll be right down. I need to freshen up a bit first. She began to trot off, then turned and looked beseechingly at my host. All pretense of being happy or worry-free had evaporated. She looked scared. Snips. Will it hurt? Her voice was almost like that of a filly. Snips swallowed hard frowned and admitted. Mistress Rarity, it'll probably redefine torture for you. Rarity gave a little shake and shrinkled back a soft whimper. Then she pulled herself together, lifting her head high. Well, at least it should be quick. She disappeared down the hall. My host watched her go until the shadows of the hallway enveloped her. Then he turned using his magic to push a block high in the wall. A grating sound filled the hallway as stone slid into stone, revealing a hidden stairwell that descended into blackness. Minutes later, my host was standing in a darkened ritual chamber. The only light was from a few glowing gemstones set within strange glyphs that shimmered with a crimson liquid and a single candle. The candle illuminated a stand upon which the black book rested. The air in the room was exceedingly chilly. I could see my host's breath. Forty-three snails, my host moaned. Rarity wants me to cut her soul into forty-three pieces. I don't know if I can do it. Forty-three? The other, taller, robed unicorn asked slowly. But there's only forty-two soul jars. I counted. Twice, just in case I messed up the first time. Yeah, yeah. She says she wanted to keep a piece for herself. What, is she giving the rest away, like, gifts or something? Snips shook his head. I don't know. He looked up. Hey, Snails. You okay? Yeah. The other unicorn said slowly. I just hope I won't mess anything up. I felt Snips sigh. Hey, you won't mess this up. Mistress Rarity wouldn't entrust something this big to pony she thought would mess up. He gave Snails an encouraging smile. Remember what Rarity always said about you. That I'm tall? No, 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 the other thing, Snips urged. 
that I may be slow, but I always get there eventually, Snail said, his voice building up in confidence. And that's better than she could say for most ponies. That's right, Snips clapped. Now go get the soul jars and be ready. This... this is really going to happen. Well, we always wanted to see some awesome magic, Snails reminisced. Okay. And this is the most awesomest. No, this isn't awesome. This is dark. This is dark magic. This is no, 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 no. Eh, yeah, Snips said, sounding a little nervous again. The room was dark and cold and still. The light of the candle flickered as the candle slowly burnt down. It felt like forever before Rarity came down the stairs. When she did, she was wrapped in a black hooded robe like she was attending her own funeral. Without a word, she walked into the center of the chamber, standing in the midst of all the softly glowing gems. Snips turned towards her, levitating the black book in front of him. Carefully, he read the alien words, words from a long dead zebra tongue, born of madness, or possibly born of the stars. I felt my host concentrate, pouring all of his focus into the single spell. I felt power wash over me, not only from within, but from without. Power drawn from strange black places. The magic was vile and repulsive. I felt violated. Rarity lifted off from the floor, beginning to float upwards as a small magical vortex pulled beneath her. The vortex of eldritch energy rose up and began to wrap itself about the unicorn mare, curling around her like a cocoon or a constricting snake. Her expression was one of mounting worry, edging swiftly towards panic, but never quite getting there. Instead, the screaming began. I wanted to pull out of the memory orb. I couldn't bear to hear those screams. Not just of pain, but of nightmarish mental anguish. I remembered my hellish ride in the autonomous healing booth. What the spell was doing to Rarity was orders of magnitude worse. The black magic washed over Snips, pulling at the tip of his horn, and then taking flight. A sphere of pure void, blacker than absolute darkness, took flight from our horn and collided with the eldritch energy spitting about Rarity. There was an explosion as the darkness turned to light, and the eldritch energies transformed into a prismatic legion of shattered lights, shrieking over Snips' head, leaving bright plasma trails behind them as they homed in on their receptacles. Snips never turned to watch. He never even looked at the soul jars. The unicorn buck only had eyes for rarity, and he dashed to catch her when she fell, unconscious, to the floor. But then, he didn't have to. He already knew what they were. How far would you go for your friends? How much would you give up for them? With all I had seen of rarity, I knew her deepest fear and greatest pain was losing her friends, seeing them drift apart, fracturing. Oh no, I'm, I'm fine. It's just sometimes it feels like we're pulling apart, and I can't stand to see that happen. I really must do something about it. What did I know of soul jars? I knew that they were virtually indestructible, eternal. I knew that you could hang other spells on them allowing these spells to last effectively forever. But if you touched it, or focused your magic on it, then a spell took a picture of your soul. I remembered being Spike, as Rarity led all of her friends down a hallway to see Rainbow Dash's new armor. I recalled the strange carpet we had walked across, and the sudden chill when Spike had stepped on it. Twilight Sparkle had reacted to it as well. Of course she had. Twilight had felt that particular chill before, from Rarity's mirror. I even suspected she was about to call Rarity on it, when Rarity just- Oh my god, no, 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 no. You're telling me the mirror that was in there was a soul jar. You're telling me the carpet was a soul jar. You're telling me all these things that Rarity has given her friends were soul jars? Distracted her with Rainbow Dash. 
Then, a second enchantment allowed the mirror to show that image. A reflection of the soul, of who you truly were, deep inside. A picture is only a picture, but a picture with that spell placed upon it would be more than just the image of a pony. It would radiate with an aura of her true soul. And Twilight? Pinkie Pie had asked in that final message, the one Twilight Sparkle had never received. Do you think... maybe... you could go with me? I'm kind of scared, and it isn't the sort of scared that goes away with giggling. I mean, I have you with me now, so you'll kind of be with me anyway. I should be there for... like she's with me. Some pony should be, Scootaloo had said, coughing violently. Just want Dash to know. We didn't all... She's not alone. 42. Only 42 were ever made, Watcher. Spike had told me. Seven sets of six. One for each of the Ministry Mares, and one for Princess Luna. Concentrating, I opened my saddlebags and floated out rarity soul jars, setting them down before me. Those all together. They were stronger, better that way. Be strong, be pleasant, be unwavering, be smart. Okay, be the mirror's awesome. not it. Awareness. It was under E. So, the things she was collecting... Okay, I got it wrong. Okay, apparently I was wrong. 42 soul jars, 42 statuettes. In the possession of the group, they have a total of... of, um... 12 soul jars, I think. And I think there's an Applejack one for Steel Hooves, and there's a, a Twilight one for uh, Twilight's mom, so that's total 14 that we know of. That's 14 that we know of. So there are 42 soul jars and that's what they were. So, I'm looking at these statues as something much more. They're not just pieces of magic that were created. They're dark magic. These little things are pieces of rarity. To show her love for her friends. She used dark magic to show her love. That's a big fucking twist. That's a big twist about Rarity. I figured she'd use the soul jars, but I figured she was using other ponies and stuff on small thing, other things other than those statuettes. I don't know why I didn't come to that conclusion. I figured this fucking mirror would have been a soul jar. But no, it's the statuettes. Shit. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome video of Fallout Equestria, and I hope to see you guys in the next. So, anyway, guys, as stay ready, my friends. Bye.